All right, so in class we're going to be talking about uh, biochemistry, the chemistry of living things. We're going to talk about water and we're going to talk about some different organic compounds. And in order to understand everything that we're going to be covering, you need a little bit of a basic chemistry foundation, which is one of the reasons why you should have taken chemistry prior to taking this class. So we're going to go through just the main basic points that you really need to remember in order to progress as far as what we're going to be talking about in class. So for starters, we're going to do a real quick walkthrough of atoms. So atoms are the smallest building blocks of matter, and we know that atoms contain three subatomic particles. We have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positive, electrons are negative, protons are in the nucleus, electrons are found around the nucleus in the electron cloud. In nature, elements are neutral because the number of protons and the number of electrons are equal to each other and therefore cancel each other out. We have different kinds of atoms, and this basically is what we look at when we talk about the periodic table. Oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, helium, molybdenum, all the different kinds of elements. And basically what makes each element different is going to be the number of protons in the nucleus. So for example, if it has six protons, it's always going to be carbon. You can change the number of neutrons, you can change the number of electrons, but if you change the number of protons, it's not going to be carbon anymore. And as I mentioned in the lecture on characteristics of living things, 96% of every living thing is really composed of just three main elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. I told you you could remember this by remembering CHO. Another thing you could remember, and you'll see when we get to biochemistry, you can remember CHOMPs, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Uh, because actually, all six of those are going to be extremely important when we talk about biochemistry. There are also elements that you need in very small quantities, and they're referred to as trace elements. You're not going to need to memorize any of the trace elements. Just be aware that there are certain elements we need very, very tiny amounts of, and these are usually, for example, vitamins and minerals. An example that your book uses of this would be iodine. Iodine is something that you need in very, very tiny amounts. You only need about 150 micrograms of it daily. There's probably enough iodine in a bag of salted pretzels to last you your entire lifetime. And yet in, say, third world countries, sometimes a lack of iodine causes a disorder called a goiter, which is a swollen thyroid gland. And so this is just an example of something that you need very, very little of, but without it, you could end up with a disorder, a deficiency. Okay, so a little more about atoms in detail. First of all, the atomic number which is the number of protons in an atom, is usually written on the bottom left. So here you see carbon again, and it had six protons, and so its atomic number here is six. The mass number, which is the number of protons and neutrons added together, is sometimes indicated in the upper left here. So this would be called carbon-12, this one would be called carbon-14. Okay, and you can see the difference between them here. Since carbon always has six protons, carbon-12, if we subtract 12 minus 6, carbon-12 has six neutrons. Carbon-14, on the other hand, has eight neutrons. So what we say is that these are different isotopes of carbon. In other words, it is true that all elements of carbon would have six protons, because that's what makes it carbon. But they don't necessarily all have the same number of neutrons. And this is true for most elements. Most elements have two or three different versions or isotopes in nature that have different numbers of neutrons. In the case of carbon, we said carbon-12 had six and carbon-14 had eight. The reason why we talk about it in biology um, is because certain isotopes can be radioactive and what that basically means is that the extra neutrons cause the nucleus to be unstable and break down over time. Carbon-14 is a good example of a radioactive isotope you may have heard of carbon dating. Um, and what that means is over time, like I said, because they're unstable, they tend to break down and they break down at a steady rate. So they don't just break down, but we know exactly the speed at which they break down. That's called a half-life. So for carbon-14, for example, it actually turns into nitrogen through a nuclear reaction. It loses a proton. And as the nucleus does this, it takes about 5,730 years. Uh, that's the half-life. So if something was to, for example, die uh, today, and we were to dig it up about 6,000 years later, it would contain about half the carbon-14 compared to the amount of nitrogen that it contains. Uh, 
compared to something that was alive today. And so they can use this ratio to determine how old certain fossils are. Carbon-14 in general is actually a poor uh, isotope for fossils because its half-life is actually fairly short. And after about 40,000 years, a fossil would be too old to actually have enough carbon-14 left to measure. And so uh, we don't use carbon-14 for, for example, dating dinosaur bones or, or something like that. We would use an isotope uh, that breaks down, has a longer half-life and breaks down more slowly. The other thing we can use these for is tracers in medicine because they actually will glow under x-rays. So for example, um, let's say they, they thought you had a blockage in your heart. What they can do is they can inject you with a radioactive iodine um, tracer and it goes through the blood vessels. They take a bunch of x-rays and they can literally see the blood vessels glowing under those x-rays and they could see, for example, if there was a blockage or something. The atomic mass is what they call the average of all of the isotopes of a particular element in nature. This is just a decimal that's found on the periodic table. We actually won't be talking about it much in class, but for example, carbon is 12.011. It's the average of all of the carbon-12 and carbon-13 and carbon-14 based on how common they are in nature, so that's why they're decimals. This is just an illustration of how half-life works because some people think that um, what half-life means is that, for example, if the half-life was 5,000 years, then that would mean that in 5,000 years half of the isotope would have broken down, and then in another 5,000 years the rest would have broken down. And that's not how half-life works. The idea of, is that it decreases by a half uh, for each half-life. So if the half-life was 5,000 years, then after 5,000 years you would have about half left, but then after the next 5,000 years you'd be down to a quarter, and then an eighth, and then a sixteenth, and the amount would just get smaller and smaller. And that's the reason why, for example, carbon-14 wouldn't be good for dinosaur bones, because it's not that there wouldn't necessarily be any more, but the amount that was left would be such a tiny amount that it just it wouldn't be enough to really be useful. This is just a diagram of, a, of an angiogram just showing you how isotopes would glow under x-rays so you could inject somebody with a dye and then you could look for example in this case for an aneurysm or a weakness in the brain and on the right is a CAT scan. Okay and as far as the arrangement of electrons you'll be happy to know that for this class you don't have to remember the 1s2, 2s2, uh, 2p6, you know that nightmare. All you really have to know for this class is just that the outermost shell, the valence shell, um, contains the electrons that are going to determine how that atom is going to react with other atoms. It's going to either give away electrons, uh, pick up electrons, or share electrons. And the outermost level has the most energy. If it um, absorbs energy, it can actually jump to a higher level, and it can then come back down and release that energy, for example, as light. Um, or, in some cases, the electron will actually break off and carry the energy with it. This is uh, the basis for electron transport chains. Ions, basically an ion is just an atom with a charge. Uh, I know you already know this. Cations have a positive charge, anions have a negative charge. This just has to do with extra or missing electrons. Calcium is one that's in muscle contraction. We'll actually learn about a lot of different ions, so don't worry about uh, memorizing that one. Okay, and so we're going to move on from atoms and uh, talk about compounds. When atoms get together, they form compounds. and um, the smallest part of a compound, for the purposes of our class, we're going to use the word molecule. You may remember from chemistry that in ionic compounds you actually don't call it a molecule, it's called a formula unit. But for us, we're just going to say that when we put atoms together, we get molecules. A really important concept that's going to kind of um, control what kind of uh, bonding is going to happen is going to be the concept of electronegativity, which is how strong electrons are pulled on by an atom. In other words, if I'm an atom, how how much do I want to pull electrons from other atoms towards me? And the stronger that, that 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 pull is, the more likely it's going to be that I'm going to steal electrons from something else. Um, so in covalent bonding, which is what we're going to see in most of the compounds we're going to talk about in this upcoming chapter, what happens is we see a sharing of electrons. And the reason why is because the electronegativities between the different atoms are almost the same. So if my electronegativity is similar to the other atom, we're going to be in sort of a tug of war. Neither one of us is going to be able to steal electrons from the other, and so we sort of end up sharing them. And that's covalent bonding. Now, um, 
in the middle, we have what's called a polar covalent bond. What happens here is there is a difference in electronegativity. One of them's pulling harder than the other on the electrons. The thing is, it's not pulling hard enough to actually steal them. It's just pulling hard enough that the electrons are sort of hanging around that atom in the in the bond more than the other one. And so what you end up with is what we call partial charges, which means that one of the atoms is slightly positive because electrons are hanging around it less, and the other one is slightly negative. The biggest example of this is water, and we actually are doing an entire chapter on water, so I'm not going to get into it right now. But the idea is that oxygen, here in the diagram, it pulls a lot harder on the electrons. Um, then the two tiny hydrogens. And so what ends up happening is the oxygen actually ends up with a slightly negative charge and the hydrogens end up with a slightly positive charge. Now the significance of this is that it leads to attractions from that one water molecule with other water molecules around it. And what we call these attractions where we have a polar covalent compound that's attracted to something else, typically it's the hydrogen of one being attracted to oxygen or nitrogen of something else. Um, we actually call that a hydrogen bond. You've learned about these before, um, although you may not remember it, but um, water is a really good example of this. And another good example of this is uh, what we see in DNA. They're, they're always represented by dotted lines. So you may remember learning about DNA and how A was connected to T and G was connected to C. And there were these dotted lines down the middle of the double helix, and that was the hydrogen bonds. They're not even really bonds. They're very, very easily broken. They're just strong attractions. Uh, but they're the result of these polar covalent bonds, which cause these partial charges, and that makes them attracted to other things around them. Ionic bonding, on the other hand, is where we have this extreme difference in electronegativity. One, one atom basically has enough uh, electronegativity that it can pull the, um, the electrons away from the other atom, and then that sort of holds them together. And ionic compounds are also extremely important in us because they form ions in water, meaning they split into those positive and negative ions, which then are involved in really important chemical reactions that we'll talk about in the body. Uh, this is just showing an example of how sodium reacts with chlorine. Uh, there's a transfer of an electron, and then we end up with sodium chloride. In chemistry, you've learned about uh, various chemical reactions, synthesis, decomposition, you may remember single replacement, double replacement. One type that you don't really learn about in chemistry, but you do learn about if you took AP chemistry, um, is something called a redox reaction or an oxidation reduction reaction. Now, we're not going to learn how to balance those. They're a bit complicated. What you do need to know is the basic definition, because this is going to play a very big role when we talk about cell respiration and when we talk about photosynthesis. So for the purposes of this class, Oxidation refers to the loss of an electron, or it could be the loss of a hydrogen atom because a, a hydrogen uh, basically only has one electron, and um, reduction is the gain of an electron. An easy way to remember this, um, you may remember from chemistry, you may have learned this, um, oil rig. Oil, oxidation is loss, and rig, reduction is gain. So oxidation is the loss of an electron, and reduction is the gain of an electron. Okay, and finally, that's going to bring us to acids and bases, which is something you should have touched on probably around the end of the year in chemistry. So for the purposes of our class, an acid is going to just be something that gives off hydrogen ions in a solution, like hydrochloric acid. And a base is going to be something that produces hydroxide ions, OH negative hydroxide, or it picks up hydrogen from solutions. And we'll talk a lot more about this in class. Sodium hydroxide is an example. The pH scale, I'm going to touch on this now, but I will go over it in class because it is a little bit complicated. But basically, even though water is neutral, it does break up a tiny, tiny, tiny amount. The, this is called the equilibrium constant for water, is 1 times 10 to the negative 14th, meaning for every mole of water, this is how many, um, how many ions there are, just this teeny, teeny, tiny number. And if water breaks up, water is actually HOH, so for every H, there'll be an OH. Um, pH is just a simple way of measuring this in whole numbers instead of using all these uh, negative exponents. So the negative log of the hydrogen concentration is the pH. You're not going to need a calculator for this. It's really simple. Uh, for our class, if they give you a hydrogen concentration, they're going to give it to you as a whole number like this, 10 to the negative 7th. You just look at this negative exponent, and that's going to be your pH. You just make it positive. So if the hydrogen concentration is 10 to the negative 5th, the pH is 5, etc. Very, very simple. Okay, but when the pH changes, this is a little more complicated. If the pH goes down by 1, in other words, pH 7 to pH 6, what actually happens is the hydrogen concentration increases 10 times. Um, and we're going to talk about that in class, so I'm not going to go over it here. 
you should know that at 7, H, pH, and pOH are equal to each other. H and OH are equal to each other. And um, below 7 is an acid and above is base. pH and pOH, they add up to 14. And you can see this here. If pH is 8, pOH is 6.